Hello. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Inside Insights. I'm Chip Truitt, and today we'll be talking with Louis Coulot, who is General Manager of Oncology, Informatics, and Genomics here at Philips. Each episode, we bring focus to one of the four horizons of precision diagnosis, smart diagnostics, optimized workflows, and integrated diagnostics, leading to clear care pathways with predictable outcomes for every patient. Today, we're going to kick off our series by talking about the impact COVID-19 has had on oncology care. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Lewis. Lewis, welcome to Inside Insights. Hi, Chip. Very glad to be here. Great. Philips is on a journey in precision diagnosis, undergoing a transformation from modalities to solutions, as I'm sure you're well aware, and I'm sure everybody else is well aware. What do you think you'd like to share with our colleagues here at Philips who work in other areas of the business and may not be quite as familiar with oncology? Yeah, thanks. And and I appreciate the the comment on our, our transformation, or I should say evolution to becoming a solutions business. And, and when I do say evolution, you know, I, I say that because I think we're really building on the incredible strength that, that Philips has, you know, first of all, in diagnostics, right? So our CT, MR, ultrasound systems, digital pathology, and also in our informatics, in our healthcare informatics. I don't know if people just realize how large an impact we already have with informatic solutions across health systems. Now, when we talk about solutions, what we're talking about are using these capabilities in completely new ways to work with hospitals and health systems to solve problems together, and in oncology, particularly in cancer care. Now, as an example, one of our solutions as a company or one of our drivers uh, is to help an oncology reduce what's called unwarranted variation. And the way I think about this is say, well, it's okay for you know, 10 different cancer patients uh, to get 10 different care plans. Cancer is one of the most, if not the most complex disease that, that's treated today. But it doesn't really make sense when a single patient gets 10 different opinions on his or her care. But then what can we do about it? And this is this really gets to something I'm really excited about. And you mentioned uh, care pathways. And in this case, we have the ability to virtualize the expertise of leading academic centers, like at Dana-Farber, uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to deliver these best practices to oncologists when they care for their patients. So the doctors get expert guidance tailored to their patient and the health systems gain an unprecedented lens into the clinical quality and how cancer care is being practiced. So when we say reducing unwarranted unwarranted variation, this is what we mean, right? Providing solutions which help at each step in the diagnosis, treatment and follow-up journey. And at the same time, providing insights at the health system level into how care is being practiced and delivered. That's great, Lewis. You know, cancer is not always easy to diagnose, especially to diagnose early. And that's only the beginning of the challenge. Now we have COVID. What can you share with our listeners about what you're seeing in terms of the unmet need and how we might address this through our care pathways? I'm glad you brought that up. When we think about COVID and how it's impacted care, let me give you two quick examples of how we and our partners and customers uh, have been adapting to this. So the expert guidance I mentioned from Dana Farber was optimized in certain diseases like breast cancer to deal with the virus, you know, both minimizing risk to the patients, so minimizing exposure risk to the entire population, and also, you know, how do we think about treating patients who are infected? So these changes were done by expert committees and then even proposed regional variations in how patients should be managed and then rolled out across a platform so that anyone using it got access to those insights immediately. Now, that's in treatment. On the diagnostics front, Philips has been a leader and I should actually say a pioneer in what's called digital pathology. Now, what is digital pathology? So digital pathology is taking the glass slides. You remember from uh, high school biology, right? The the glass slides that pathologists use today and microscopes that they use to to diagnose uh, patients. And they've been using this for over a century. And we're now able to take this and turn it into a fully digital experience. So take those glass slides and digitize them, and then using our informatics layer, orchestrate that care anywhere. So with COVID, we saw a huge uptick in telepathology. Doctors now being able to diagnose patients remotely from biopsies taken on site in a hospital. The slides are prepped, stained, and scanned, and a pathologist can literally be anywhere that they have a connection to review the cases, just like they're peering into a microscope. That's terrific. I think what you've reminded me of is that so much has changed because of COVID that we weren't expecting not just that people would host telemedicine visits, but that doctors can talk to each other so easily through telemedicine now. 
Uh, and whether it's telepathology or teleradiology or cardiology or the like, it's incredible how dramatically increased the use of this uh, telemedicine platform yeah, has absolutely. already taken place. Yeah. So one cancer that Philips is particularly focused on is prostate cancer. It's a peculiar cancer in that many men harbor prostate cancer, a so-called indolent cancer, but they don't seem to progress over time, and the lesions are probably better left alone than meddled with. There are others, obviously, that are further along and do need to be addressed. And do we have an approach at Phillips for how we address this diagnostic question of determining which men should be cared for by active surveillance to make sure that nothing is progressing and which ones have either progressed enough or are progressing and need treatment? So, you know, while prostate cancer survival rates certainly have you know, dramatically improved, uh, as you point out, men are, are diagnosed at many stages of the disease, from indolent cancers to very advanced cancers, which threaten their lives. So I, I think we need to emphasize the importance of getting the diagnosis right in the first place. So as an example, if we if we so-called overstage a disease, and that means we effectively treat the patient as if they have a more aggressive disease than they actually do, then the cure can be worse than the disease. So it could be a cancer that that could have been left under active surveillance, but it was treated as if it was more advanced. And therefore, the patient now is dealing possibly with side effect issues or lifestyle impact that really could be avoided, and not to mention the cost of treatment. Now, if you flip that around, and on the other hand, we undertreat a patient with a more aggressive disease, then unfortunately for the patient, the disease will continue to progress. So to your question about helping docs decide who should go on active surveillance and who should be treated, Yes, this is something we can help with, but in this case, we try to do it at the stage of diagnosis. And importantly, you know, we also try to do this in the context of the entire population of patients. And once again, the whole of what we try to bring in terms of solutions is being able to focus and measure and learn from not just how the docs are diagnosing and treating patients, but then what's happening to those patients and can we follow them. Interesting. Historically, people, urologists have used ultrasound to try to examine the prostate and evaluate it, and in fact, guide biopsies. And unfortunately, there have been, shall we say, less than optimal results. Phillips developed this unique approach of fusing the MR images with the ultrasound images in order to perform and target prostate biopsies. What can you tell us about this technology and how critically important it is to Phillips and to patients that have prostate cancer? Yeah, and we'll maybe start with the end, which is why is it so important? And it, it touches back to the prior conversation on you know, if we want to get a patient down the correct path in treatment, getting that diagnosis right in the first place is essential. And so getting to this MR and ultrasound combination, it's, it's really an amazing technology. As, as you point out, prostate biopsies uh, were traditionally carried out with ultrasound guidance alone. And if you've ever seen an ultrasound image, you can picture the graininess, but this is what urologists use to find the prostate and the locations to then biopsy you know, or sample the, the prostate for diagnosis. And they sample it a few times, and each of these samples is sent to a pathologist who then determines the stage of, of the disease and from that, therefore, the care plan for the patient. Now, if you get it wrong, you get a care plan wrong, right, by definition. So what we've done, and I should say this has really been pioneered by a disease management solutions group uh, uh, in partnership with the uh, National Institutes of Health, was to combine the high resolution and extra imaging data from that MR exam and fuse it or merge it with the live ultrasound feed. So the MR, which of course is a static image taken in a scanner, looks to the urologist like it's moving around with the ultrasound probe. And now this has been a proven approach to get a better sampling of the prostate from the correct locations. Fewer samples and rebiopsy are needed. And as we said, it now leads to the correct care for that specific patient. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly um, cool technology. And if you get a chance, it's something that's it's very visual. And I encourage people to take a look at it. So what you've described in the first phase is the improvements in how we stratify patients with improved MR images, improving both the targeting and the outcomes of the biopsies, both reducing the number of biopsies and reducing the number of false negative biopsies. And what I find really fascinating about our approach is that we didn't stop there. We didn't just combine the MR with the ultrasound. Now we've combined the MR with the LINAC program. So we streamline and combine the imaging with the therapy itself. 
So we use imaging for the diagnosis, imaging guidance for the biopsy and specific diagnosis, and then imaging and the LINAC for the therapy. Can you share with us uh, and our listeners here a little bit about how we have progressed in this MR LINAC program and really the end-to-end type of solution and how AI has enriched this approach? Yeah, and it does really tie the story together, right? Because now we're in the delivery of treatment phase. So we have our prostate patient, the one we've been talking about, right? He's come in for his exam. He's had his MR ultrasound guided biopsy, uh, leading to the correct staging in pathology. And through expert pathways, this virtualization of expertise, uh, decided that the best course of treatment is radiation therapy. And that radiation therapy is going to have a certain amount of radiation dose that the doc wants to deliver to the cancer. Now, and, and, and that's the LINAC, right? The LINAC is, is short form for linear accelerator, and that's how that's the device that actually delivers the radiation dose. Now, typically, a patient will have what's called a simulation plan done first. They come in, um, they, they're not actually getting their, their treatment, but they come in and they get they go into a CT or MR scanner and they get imaged for the, the sole purpose of designing a plan. To, that will maximize the radiation to the tumor and minimize the radiation to the surrounding organs, which can be easily damaged by the radiation dose. You know, a lot of these cancers are in the torso and other sensitive areas. And so we really want to optimize how we treat the tumor and then minimize the dose to the surrounding tissue. Now, patients don't stay perfectly static, right? You come in for your plan, you come back to get treated, you move around, you're not exactly in the same spot. And so our radiation oncology team thought, well, what if we can put these together at the same time and have a live feedback from the MR scanner while the patient's undergoing treatment. Then using adaptive intelligence in real time, adjust the dose plan for radiation. So now getting back to our patient, he can receive an optimal dose of radiation to the cancer, minimizing radiation everywhere. And I do want to tie this back to the question on COVID because we can do it this way and actually deliver a higher dose to the cancer and fewer visits the patient doesn't have to come back for the multiple treatments that they would have had to otherwise. So it has another effect. And so when we have a solution like this, it's better for the patient and better for the cost of care. We know we're on the right track. I think you're right. Louis, this has been an incredibly interesting discussion. Louis, again, thanks very much for joining me today on our inaugural podcast of Inside Insights. Thanks so much, Chip. It was a pleasure. 